If you look at the headlines, if you read the newspaper, you'd be forgiven for thinking there's just no way we as humans can one day all get along. I'd like to posit a somewhat radical theory about the discord and strife you see in the world today. And that is we're all on a journey, but we're at different stages of that journey. And that journey is our understanding of analog DC video restoration. There's probably four phases um, to this journey. Phase zero is probably where most people are, which is, I don't even know what that is. Why would I care about that? Phase two, let's use a capacitor, maybe a diode, we'll be fine. Phase three is the real way of doing it seems way too complicated. I might do it in post, do it in digital. I'll come up with some sort of half hour circuit to do it. Um, and stage four is do it the proper way. And I'm doing it the proper way uh, in this circuit. So in today's video, <laughs> um, I wanna share with you this circuit, which uh, does very, very little. Um, video comes in on one side, goes out on the other side. Uh, just looking at one channel here. Um, and the video that comes out is exactly what goes in. Uh, no noticeable difference. There are some knobs for some tweaks. Um, it's quite a boring device in terms of what it does, but it's really interesting. And it's been a while since I've been so chuffed uh, about um, the outcome of a project. So in today's video, we're gonna go a tour through the four different parts of this circuit. Um, we're trialing four brand new chips to me, um, and they've all worked really well. Uh, we have our sync separator circuit up here, a phase lock loop thing for generating a pixel clock, and we have two new chips involved in DC restoration. So strap in, this is gonna be a wildly exciting ride as we go through four awesome new chips in my arsenal. Up in the top corner here, we have our first part of our circuit, which does sync separation, or identifying the parts of an analog video signal that are sync related. Um, if you've been doing this at all before, you've probably used the LM1881. What we have here is a new chip to me, the LMH1980. Um, this basically does the exact same thing as an LM1881, but it is a more modern chip. While the original 1881 can deal with um, high horizontal sync frequencies like you see in HD video, which is what we're looking at here on the scope, um, it wasn't designed for it. Um, this chip is also a little bit more easy to use uh, rather than requiring an external resistor and capacitor to deal with um, some color burst stuff. It just requires one precision 10K temperature comp compensated uh, or low temperature coefficient resistor. Um, and apart from that, it, it's pretty much plug and play and it does what it says on the box. I've got a few additional chips here. I've got one inverting, uh, just inverter. Um, most of the outputs here, so if we look at the horizontal sync output here, which we're now seeing in blue, um, most of them are active low. I like them being active high, so we have an inverter. One thing to call out with this chip is it understands um, tri-level sync, like what you see here in this HD video, and it understands that the actual sync point for a tri-level sync occurs in the middle of this transition. And so if you look at the horizontal sync pulse, it's t designed to you know, line up, uh, at least it starts coming up um, at that sync pulse, at that middle transition there. It also has an additional output, which is the HD output. Um, that's powering this LED here. When it detects a tri-level sync, um, HD goes high. Um, there are some other things I was intending to do with it. This just comes straight out of the data sheet. Um, they suggest including a transistor and a capacitor and a resistor uh, to form a low pass filter to filter out color burst information from coming into here. Um, and to actually, yeah, filter that out. Um, and it does that when you're not in the HD world. Given that I'm mainly working with HD, this, is an import this doesn't matter to me. I also just forgot to order that transistor from DigiKey, so I didn't have one in stock, so it's working fine without it. That is this chip here. Oh, uh, this part of the circuit here. I also have one more chip. Uh, after I invert them to get them you know, positive high, uh, I also and or, or or a few of them together to give me all the sync pulses or the sync related pulses at the um, same time. So to give me a sense of when I'm in the sync region versus in the active pixel region. Um, and this could then feed into something else that elongates that out. Um, but yeah, that's all this does, pretty straightforward. Let's move over to these two chips here, what were originally three chips, uh, but I'm only going with two. And what we're doing over in this corner is uh, generating a pixel clock. So let me uh, get you another output going into the scope and you can see what's happening over here. So we turn on this channel and we see a mess of noise. 
uh, well, a very fast signal. Here we have a square wave coming out of this pixel clock. Um, and this square wave is synced to the start of each line. Here we have the uh, horizontal sync pulse here. Let's uh, see if we can look at the frequency of this. Counter channel three on. Yeah, so about uh, four and a half megahertz uh, a pixel clock coming out here. Um, this is using a phased lock loop circuit, and I've used uh, PLLs before. There's the, uh, what is it, NE567, um, little 8-pin jobby, and there's the uh, CMOS4066. Now, I wanted to generate a pixel clock that was synced to the start of each line. Um, for HD video, you're talking about like 149 megahertz pixel clock. Um, the CD4066, uh, I think, caps out at like 2 megahertz. So I started looking online for a variety of chips that could do a f frequency multiplier. Uh, effectively, what we're trying to do is take this blue wave here, which is one pulse per side of each line that's coming out at, you know, 30, 60 kilohertz, uh, depending on sort of frame rate and that sort of stuff. And we want to multiply that by the number of pixels um, in a screen. In 1920 by 1080, there's effectively 2,200 pixels. So we want to take this pulse here and multiply the frequency by 2,200. And uh, chips of yore could not do that. And so I started looking into the high frequency frequency multipliers. And, and there are plenty that are out there. Um, but a lot of them have I squared C control or SPI control. They, they needed to pair with some sort of microprocessor to set it all up and to get it to work. And I was trying to build a board that didn't involve a microprocessor. And um, then I realized, one sec, I could do the same trick I've done for my other sort of 4000 series chips that I use in video and look at the 74LV series. That's a more modern variant of the original 4000 series um, that operates at higher clock frequencies. And lo and behold, there is a 74LV4046 um, that is rated up to 30 odd megahertz. And um, so I plonked it in here um, and, and it works, but I'm not so happy with it. Um, but before I go into why I'm not so happy with it, I think it's worth having a bit of an excursion into what phase lock loop actually is. Um, so maybe I'll pull up um, a diagram and we'll talk through that diagram and talk through how it works and why I'm not so happy with it in this context. So what is a PLL? Um, a PLL is a, or a phase lock loop is an interesting idea out of control theory. And it is a versatile building block for digital and analog applications. Some of the applications that I'm interested in for this are uh, frequency multiplication and clock synchronization. This is the data sheet for the 4046, uh, the original sort of CMOS variety. I misspoke and I said before that this was um, good up to 2 megahertz, 2 megahertz. This one, this CD variant, is only good up to 1.2 megahertz. I'm actually using the 74LV version. So what is a PLL? Um, let's see if there are some good diagrams in here. Th this is the basic idea. You, you have a negative feedback loop where you have a signal coming in to a comparator that compares the, the phase of the input signal and some other signal coming in here. And it gives you a voltage out um, that is a waveform that represents the phase difference between these two input signals. It goes into a low pass filter, which um, smooths out sort of the, the noise here or smooths out sort of oscillations that might occur, um, integrates that signal and then goes into a voltage controlled oscillator. And so you have this feedback loop whereby, well, it's probably helpful if we look at um, uh, what the comparator does. Let's have a look. I'm using phase comparator two. And this is, yeah, phase comparator two. Um, this is not a great diagram. A phase comparator two output. Um, Okay, so if we have um, two signals here, uh, this is the signal coming in and this is the, the feedback signal coming back into the comparator input or coming out of the VCO. Um, it's hard to see here, but there is a very small phase delay between that up going edge here and this up going edge here. So um, there are a few different phase comparators built into a 4046. The phase comparator two just looks at the rising edge and puts out a pulse going up when this edge has gone up, 
but this edge hasn't yet gone up. And likewise, it puts a downward edge when you have this sort of lagging condition that you see here. You think they would have chosen, and here they're completely in phase, and so it's just doing average voltage out. Um, so what it's doing is this phase comparator output goes into that filter, then feeds into the VCO, and tunes the frequency of the voltage controlled oscillator so that these edges come close together, because this is the output of the voltage controlled oscillator. And so if this is a signal like a horizontal um, refresh signal or horizontal sync pulse, and this is what you want to make a copy of that, uh, another horizontal sync pulse, um, and you have nothing in that feedback path, this will then sync up to that. The interesting thing that you do is you modify the feedback path to get a multiplier. So if you put in here some sort of uh, divide by n, where n is the multiple you want to get out of that signal, it will be seeing the delayed version of the VCO and trying to sync that up. So it'll be looking at um, the input here being n times slower than what the VCO is actually generating. Um, and it'll lock those in phase, and because that's an integer multiple, the VCO will be operating at n times higher frequency. So I want to generate a clock signal that um, takes the horizontal you know, scanning uh, sync pulse and generates a pulse for each pixel. Um, that's not possible using this chip um, for 1080p uh, 60, uh, because that would be 150 megahertz. This chip's only good up to like 30, 34 megahertz. Um, but you could say divide it by um, one every four pixels. So that would be dividing it by 5,500, because there's 2,200 pixels effectively in a 1920 image. Um, and you could get a, a signal out here that works. And you know, as you saw in the circuit, I, I've been messing around with it. That chip that was missing um, was uh, uh, part of the divide by n operation. I used two chips to divide by n. I had a um, you know, 4040, which is a 14-bit uh, counter. And so that gives you a, a binary representation of how many pulses have happened. Then I used another chip to uh, pick off the bits that correspond to divide by 550, because that's a nice multiple power of two. So I needed a second chip to do that. I removed that chip because this, this um, setup here, using this particular chip or this family of chips, you need to tune the voltage controlled oscillator frequency to be around what you want it to be. Um, so if you want this to be around, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but like 16 megahertz or um, something like that, you need to tune this center frequency um, to be 16 megahertz and then give it enough wiggle room left and right so that the voltage control level will search within that range to find the actual frequency that locks into this. Hopefully this is making sense. Um, and the way you tune this chip is by using resistors and capacitors and there's a relatively complicated uh, bit of math. Well, not that complicated, but there's some formulas you need to apply to find the right uh, resistors and capacitors, and you've got these procedures that you use to choose the components for the VCO. And the problem that I'm having is I want to build a device that works from NTSC all the way up to you know 1080p 60. So you're talking about pixel clocks, or even PAL is lower, of like four megahertz going up to 150 megahertz, um, which would mean you'd need to detect the frequency and switch out these components. Um, for the right signal um, so that the VCO is tuned to the right center frequency so that you could lock. Um, it's totally doable. Um, uh, you could do it without a microcontroller. Um, you could count the number of lines, you could count the, the clock rate, and then basically set up a truth table that picks the right components using a, like an analog switch. It's getting um, a little, not tricky, but just a little annoying. And so the reason why I ended up on this chip is I was trying to avoid using a microcontroller in this circuit. Um, I think it's unavoidable to get the pixel clock out the way I want it to do. So this was an interesting sort of side journey. Um, but um, I think for any future pixel clocks, I'll use some sort of micro and a PLL circuit that is configurable over I squared C. So for those of you who have stuck around this far, your diligence is to be rewarded because now is time. Now is time uh, for the main event where we're going to be doing DC restoration, what I would say is the right way. 
um, using two pretty amazing chips. I'm not going to hold the suspense much longer. We have the OPA 615, 600 mega, 700, 800 megahertz, I think, uh, bandwidth uh, dual operational transconductance amplifier, and the analog devices AD8037 um, op amp. Uh, only rated at 220 megahertz, but it's got some tricks up its sleeve. Uh, before we dive into that, let's talk about what DC restoration is and why you might be interested in it. Um, we're looking here at um, some horizontal scan lines from a video. And uh, if you look at the spec, it says that the sync pulse is at negative 700 millivolts. Negative in reference to what? Um, voltages are always in reference to something. You'd think it would be in reference to ground, like the, the outside shield of this cable, but no, that is not the case. Um, it is in reference to this level here, this straight line there. That is declared to be zero volts. That is declared to be minus 700 or so volts, 700 or so millivolts. Um, that is black, that is white. All those voltages are defined very deeply in the standard and the IRE correspondence and all of that. But it's all in reference to this and so you, you you might want that to be zero volts in your actual circuit if you if you if you care about that sort of stuff um, so how would you do that well we're looking here at the output of uh, you know black magic uh, SDI to analog converter and this is in relation to ground in relation to the shielding that is one volt higher than that the signal never goes negative um, in reference to the ground shield. So, hey, well, you know, you could just subtract one volt off this, and I've certainly done that in the past, and everything's good and dandy. Um, except the one volt isn't a standard. It's just what analog, uh, it's just what a uh, black magic does. Some other people do it as well, um, but there's no guarantee um, that uh, you'll be subtracting the right amount off. So the, the basic first order thing you might do, and I might just read you the cables here. We're just looking at the straight output um, of this guy let's run it through my device so we can see it in action um yeah 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 you go there you go there um that's i've got an amplifier in here so i can adjust the gain but then i'm going to mess up my triggering um there we go um what you typically would do is you know basically you could just ac couple you, you could stick a capacitor in there and I've done that, that's in the signal path here. I'll, I'll go into the circuit diagram in a second. But we, we start by AC coupling. And um, if we set our scale to be on this guy, uh, let's just set that to zero there. So zero volts is now in the middle of the screen. And so it's around zero volts, but you see it jumping up and down a bunch. I don't know if you can see that. AC coupling, like by doing a capacitor, doesn't mean some, by some magical law of the universe um, that your signal will be centered around zero volts. It will be if it's a sinusoid and it spends exactly the same amount of time plus uh, above the, the average voltage as it does below the average voltage. But here the median voltage is different to the mean voltage and depending on the content of this scan line, the average value will, will, will shift up and down. And so that doesn't quite get you to, to what you want to do. Um, what you could do, and I've done this before as well, is you can add a diode with like a you know, 700 millivolt, surprise, surprise, or 600 millivolt forward uh, voltage on there. And that'll effectively, if that's reverse biased, um, when this negative tip happens, it'll force that other leg of the capacitor to be at ground. That sort of works, but it, it's not perfect for a variety of reasons. Better things to do uh, to sample, let's go look at the output signal again, back in the scope, um, is you sample what this voltage is and you find the difference between what that voltage is and what your zero volt potential is and you subtract that off the signal. And the way you do that is we are using this OPA615 um, as an interesting, it's got a sample and hold uh, circuit in there. Um, and we are putting that onto the offset of this uh, op amp via an operational transconductance amplifier, which is a, an interesting thing. And um, it changes the offset 
um, in a feedback loop during this little time period here, the time period defined by the back porch coming out of this guy here. Um, blah, blah, blah. So when that blue pulse is high, it does sampling. It can, has a feedback loop going back through this OPA615, checks the voltage and keeps on adjusting it down until it hits the reference level. And where is that reference level set? It's set by whoop, this knob here. And if I move it out of my triggering level, um, it'll mess up triggering. But you can set whatever you want zero volts to be. You can set it to zero volts, you can set it to one volt, you can set it whatever you want. Um, I'm trying to turn off the wrong channel. Um, and it works. So uh, before we dive into the circuit diagram, I want to talk about this guy here, because this is an interesting little op amp. This AD8036, 8037, they're, they're two chips. Um, that uh, are both basically, you know, high-speed op amps, but um, and I've got them set up in a non-inverting amplifier, so I can amplify um, from a gain of one to, to to much higher than one. I've just you know, not capped it at anything. Um, but they also have two other inputs. They have a low and a high voltage input. The low, just because of the way the circuit's wired up right now, isn't super useful. But what those do is they set clamping levels. They set an absolute upper and lower bound for the signal. And if you turn that down, it'll clamp the signal to always be below that level. So maybe if I turn my gain up a bit, you can see I'm clamping the output. Now that's interesting. This goes back to my, where is it? takes us back to the start of this journey, which is my doing color correction and curve editing in the analog domain. Um, go back and watch this video. It's, it, I think it's super interesting, um, but it's applying log and exponential transforms to a video signal to get um, curve editing to, to do fine sort of resolution um, color correction. And um, the way that worked was with op amps with diodes, sorry, transistors in the feedback path that give you an exponential transform. It was complicated, it was finicky, it was, it was hard to find the sweet spot of those transistors. It worked, um, but it, it was a bit of a pain in the ass. This chip applies effectively a soft knee at the upper end and the lower end of a signal, which gives you a curve. Um, I might rewire some things here and uh, show you a good way of looking at that. So let's go into the signal generator. Hey, I've got one set up already. It's almost like I prepared. Um, here, we're, well, I've, um, I've currently got the low level uh, not plugged in. Anyway, so let me tell you what we're seeing here. Here, I'm just generating a, a, a triangle wave. This little glitch you see here is when the uh, sync separator thinks it's seeing a sync signal because I've got the frequency at what? What do I have the frequency at? 60 kilohertz, which is, whoop, let's turn that back on, um, which is close enough to an actual um, uh, horizontal frequency from a, a video thing. But anyway, um, this is the signal coming out of here is a triangle wave without that little boop de boop And if I turn this knob down, we get some nice rounded edges. I don't know if you can see that, but nice rounded edges. And so you can imagine um, if this was your curve editor, that's building up the top end of the S curve. I don't currently have this one jumpered in. I, I had that configurable, but hey, we've got a jumper here. Um, I'll put in the low level. And I've messed up my sink. I can pick a sink somewhere in the middle. Look at that. Well, I've got my low set to zero volts. So if I change the offset, uh, make it a bit higher. Um, take it to one volt and high level to two volts, two volts. Oh, I've got some gain in here that's messing it up. But anyway, you can see you get some really nice curve editing happening with this chip without messing up any other stuff without having to deal with weird biasing of transistors. And these V high and V low inputs, they operate up to 220 megahertz as well. 
So you could do some really interesting stuff with that. So this chip, this AD8037, um, is not necessary for the, the DC restoration, but I found a bunch of them really cheap. And so I bought a bunch of them and I hope they'd be as good as this. And they are awesome. Um, you know, we're running here, you know, 60 kilohertz signal, but this, this guy's rated up to, you know, well into the HD range or, you know, above HD. Um, so I'm really excited by the ability to take all of the crazy math and simulation that I had to do to get this work and to just get a chip off the shelf that does that in, an, in a really nice way um, is awesome. Now, this chip here, the OPA615, um, is an interesting story. I actually bought that chip um, thinking it would be useful for voltage controlled amplifiers. Like um, if you look at the analog synth world, they use OTAs, transconduction amplifiers to build voltage controlled amplifiers. Um, and so I was looking for high speed OTAs and I came across this 615 chip that had an OTA in there that was rated well north of um, HD, you know, 4K, higher than that. Um, as I said, like 800 megahertz. So I bought one, and I bought a couple of them thinking I'd play with them, but I got sidetracked by something else. And then when I ran into the DC restoration issues uh, with the way I was trying to do it on this board, um, I did some Googling on what would be a good way to do DC restoration. And I was reminded that the OPA615 is designed to be a DC restoration chip. So it does exactly um, uh, that when it's configured in a certain way. So let's look at the circuit diagram uh, for how I'm doing this. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll be as excited as I am by these two chips here. You know, the stuff going up here is cool. Like that's a cool chip, you know, that's cool. Didn't really do what I wanted to do. These two are complicated and they're doing exactly uh, what I wanted them to do and in a really low noise, super spectacular way. Um, and actually there's one thing I didn't do. Let me do one quick demo. Give me a sec. I'll go back to going into the input. So when, when we were looking at the output of this, like it was a super rock solid uh, one volt offset, that wasn't an impressive use case for DC restoration. Let me get myself a really shitty uh, video source. Alrighty, uh, shitty video source has been acquired. Um, it is a security camera. Uh, it definitely has AC coupled outputs. And one of the problems that you have with that is what I'm gonna demonstrate to you now. So let's take that guy, stick it in this guy. And here we have some NTSC uh, video. I've zoomed out a bit, so you're seeing multiple frames at a time. Dark video, oh look, the level is drifting up. Light video, oh, it's drifting down. Each scan line goes throughout as well. There's some capacitance going on in there. That means unlike the Blackmagic device where regardless of what the video content was, it was always offset by one volt because it was all being done in the digital domain. These guys here, uh, not so rock steady. So let's put it through the rock steady in 2000. Um, let's take that look at this. Uh, B and C cables, I got them everywhere. And stick it in there. Hey, rock steady. I can move that up. Oop. And it stays right there. Move it down. I can trim the highs. And uh, yeah. I'm actually curious what uh, the clipping would do in the composite, sorry, yeah, composite video world to the IQ modulation. You know what, this video is getting super long. Um, I'm not gonna dive into the circuit diagram. If you're interested in the circuit diagram for how this works, give me a comment down below and I'll do a separate video walking through that. Thanks for sticking around and watching this tour of hopefully five very interesting HD analog video chips. Um, plenty more to dive into. Let me know if you want me to go deep into stuff. If not, um, I'll see you in a couple of weeks for the next installment of Josh Does Weird Stuff with Video. See ya.